Good evening, Rob. Uh, hi, Ed. Um, uh, hello, uh, Blogging Heads viewers. Uh, my name, of course, is Rob Farley. I am uh, uh, work at the uh, Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. And uh, uh, with us tonight is uh, Ed Carpenter. Ed, can you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. My name is uh, uh, Ed Carpenter. And, and before I get too much further, I need to give you my standard disclaimer. Um, the opinions expressed by me uh, do not represent the Marine Corps, the United States Naval Service, or the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. With that said, I am currently an active duty uh, major in the United States Marine Corps, uh, formerly an Army enlisted man. Uh, I've been serving uh, one way or another for about 23 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, uh, I have a background in uh, national security studies, a master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School um, in Monterey, California. Uh, I speak Indonesian French. Um, I've served extensively overseas, including uh, Indonesia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, um, tours in both uh, the Iraqi theater of combat and Afghanistan. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions you have, happy to answer them. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, we should also note, uh, uh, I, I, just in case anybody wonders, because uh, a, 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 a close contact of both of ours uh, happens to be your sister. Um, and that's, uh, that's Charlie Carpenter. Um, and she helped introduce us. So, um, so you have recently written, you've recently made a, a significant contribution to a debate that's been pretty long, uh, on pretty uh, going on for a long time now. Um, and this uh, has to do with the question of um, sort of on the narrow part, uh, the role that um, women can play in the infantry and the women play in combat, and sort of more broadly um, about arguments uh, specifically about misogyny in the armed forces. Um, and you were responding, and I forget her name, but you were responding to um, this most recent piece of yours was responding to uh, an article um, by, it was a female Marine, is that, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, a female captain uh, named Lauren Serrano uh, wrote a, um, an essay that won a contest um, in our uh, professional journal, the Marine Corps Gazette, which is basically our peer-reviewed journal. Um, and this, uh, the essay contest she won was supposed to select uh, a really brilliant, bright, bold, daring idea that upset the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, it's very telling um, that the article that was selected by senior members of, of the Marine Corps um, and their retired staff was, in fact, an article that completely supported the status quo, which is continue to exclude women from combat, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, you know, I did find that part, you know, particularly um, interesting, right, because, uh, you know, the, the entire, the entire uh, purpose of this award was to, you have a, you have a wagging in your background, that's, all, that's excellent. Um, I appreciate giant dog. Right. Um, the entire point of this was for somebody to make sort of an in-your-face argument that um, challenged accepted mores and challenged accepted. And the logic here seemed to be that, you know, the idea of women in combat was so well accepted that it would be sort of radically original to come in and say, oh, hey, maybe women shouldn't serve in combat because they can't burp, fart, etc. Et um, but, um, and so that was that was a really interesting part of the article, right? Challenging, you know, is this really something that challenges the status quo? Um, but I guess, like, how else would you summarize like the response you wrote to this article? Well, so one of the responses I wrote, um, because to summarize one of the key differences between her article mm -hmm. and other articles that have actually been written by female marines, so she is not the first female marine to have weighed mm -hmm. in saying um, this shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't go to an integrated um, infantry force. Um, but previous arguments have been, you know, women's bodies can't handle the strain. They can't make it through training. They won't, they won't work. Um, but the Marine Corps is currently engaged in some studies to determine, you know, what is the ground truth. And in fact, we've so far had uh, 55 young women have com successfully completed our school of infantry, even though they're not currently allowed to serve in our infantry forces. So now that the idea that women's bodies somehow can't handle the strain has kind of been debunked, um, Captain Serrano is weighing in and says, well, it doesn't really matter whether you can pass the tests or not. Mm -hmm. What matters is if you put women with men, they're going to instruct this, this manly brotherhood um, mm -hmm. where we are allowed to scratch our balls and burp and fart and tell sex stories and actually do a lot of things that, in fact, no Marine in our workspace is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and those are orders that come straight from our commandant. Um, straight from the general level commands at our Marine Expeditionary Forces to kind of tell us what the, the boundaries of acceptable behavior in the workplace are. And pretty much everything she describes in her article um, uh, pretty much goes against that. 
Um, so that was the other one. The other point she makes is, um, well, you know, they're going, you know, rapes are going to happen. Sexual assault is going to happen. Um, anytime that you put, you know, these, so she kind of places the infantryman. She tries mm -hmm. to make Marine infantryman sound like he's a super testosterone, 18 to 20 year old, uncontrolled right. male beast. Um, but in fact, these are just random sampling of all the people who sign up to all the male people who sign up to be, um, Marines. Some of them become infantrymen. Some of them go to do other things, but it's not based on some testosterone test they give them in the hospital when they check in. Um, it's kind of based on the luck of the draw. Oftentimes it's actually based on how smart they are. Right. Um, right. There is a historically, you know, ASVAB scores. If you have a very high score, the ASVAB is basically our SAT for the military. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a very high score, they're going to say, we want you to go do something technical. And if you have a lower score, you may end up as a truck driver. You may very well end up as an infantry marine. Right. Now, that's not to say that infantry marines are dumb. In fact, some of the smartest officers I know are infantry marines. Um, but it is to say that, uh, that testosterone, your level of masculinity, is not one of the tests that is applied. Um, so right. That's pretty much what I wrote to debunk for those, right. those aspects of her argument. Right. I mean, so I mean, I guess sort of broadly speaking, um, there are three arguments that I'm familiar with with respect, and she touches on the last. She really concentrates on the last two. The first one is this um, fairly easily debunkable argument with respect to physical standards, right? Which the answer has always been, okay, well, have the physical standards and see if women can meet it, right? There's no a priori reason to exclude women from this, right? Um, the second argument is, I think, what you referenced was is a unit cohesion argument, right? That the um, presence of women could potentially reduce the combat effectiveness of the unit by changing the behavior of the male organs, right? Yep. And, and Rob, I'd just like to point out that the, the counterpoint to that is mm -hmm. the one I also made in my um, response, mm -hmm. which is that these are the exact same arguments um, that were made in 1949 about the integration of black Marines right. um, who were not originally allowed to serve in combat units. In fact, throughout World War II, they were not explicitly allowed to serve as infantrymen, even though on Saipan, um, many times they were actually engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Japanese, mm -hmm. but only because they were in the process of carrying ammunition or supplies forward and they were engaged. And it's also the same argument that our current commandant made in 2010 about gays in the military. Um, uh, at the, he was the last man standing on uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the company line then, too, was, well, if you allow um, openly gay troops to serve in the Marine Corps, you're going to destroy this unit cohesion. You're going to destroy this, this brotherhood. Our combat effectiveness is going to break down. Mm -hmm. And uh, and four years later, it's clear that none of that happened. So. Right, right. So there there is reason to be – there is a we, we have good reason to be suspicious of these arguments um, from the start, right? Because these are arguments that have been used in the past to exclude um, – groups that have historically been excluded from a bunch of different places, right? And the same argument is used about women. But, I mean, I suppose, you know, you know, we, 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 we could, we, I don't know if it would be conceding too much to, to say, in fact, I think it would be conceding too much to be, to say that, um, you know, uh, you know, maybe the arguments are more plausible in this context because, of course, men and women work together all the time in the situations that, um, are sort of deeply cohesive that require teamwork and so forth, and they manage to work together very successfully. But so anyway, this is the second argument, and then the third argument is um, the one that perhaps I find even a little bit more deeply offensive, um, which is this sexual assault argument. Right, that um, if you put women into um, these um, these uh, contexts. Um, where there is, uh, you know, they are in combat, they are engaged in combat consistently, then you will have more sexual assaults. And it's, it's, it's an argument that is almost offensive in every way that an argument could be offensive, right? It is offensive to the soldiers and Marines who are um, themselves in the infantry, right? Because it implies that they like the professionalism and the self-control, right? Perhaps, yeah, it requires a great deal of professionalism and self-control to, to, be in the infantry, right, to engage in combat in the first place. And so the argument that these people lack self-control because they're some sort of warrior brutes is almost on its face absurd. I believe that's correct. And I think uh, so, something that has occurred to me in the last few days, you know, after you write a piece, you'll always think back, you know, how, how could you have argued it better? What other case you've made? One of the very interesting things, I think, is to look at other historical contexts, and we have some that are actually quite recent, in which uh, groups of men and women are put in very close quarters in a very stressful situation, um, which may not be combat, but but has a lot of similarities. And do you have a lot of 
sexual assaults. Um, and I'll give you an example. Very recently occurred to me is uh, the mountaintop um, which the Yazidi people, a, a great number, um, thousands, hundreds of, of men and women in very tight quarters and very austere quarters. Uh, and this was not a case where you know men were looking to their left and right and saying, you know, "Who shall I rape today?" Um, this was a case where all these people were in it together against a common foe, very much like you would be in the Marine Corps. And in fact, where they all share this common uh, tribal or family bond. And mm -hmm. we in the Marine Corps um, think of ourselves very much as a family at the unit level. Um, for many of us, for some of us, this becomes our family, really. Um, people are coming from broken homes, or they're coming from uh, places that are not very good. Mm -hmm. um, but so if you think about you know, what, how the Marine Corps presents itself, which is that we are a family and that we are a tribe of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, and then to think that we would be assaulting our own, basically our brothers, our sisters, because obviously sexual assault is not a, a male on female problem strictly. Um, there's male on male, there's female on male. Um, but to think that it would be an endemic problem within our ranks, um, just because you put people in tight quarters, um, in austere quarters facing you know, an unknown opponent, um, and I don't think that reflects in other human experiences. I genuinely do not believe it would reflect in the Marine Corps of Army. Right, right, and and you know we shouldn't minimize we shouldn't minimize the because there there is you know and the the statistics could be misleading in in various ways right there's obviously in the army and the marine corps victorious there is a sexual assault problem in the military but it is a problem that has existed prior to um, the integration of women in, into combat units right and it has it existed prior to the the integration of gays into combat units right and so there has to be some sort of much more compelling argument that leads us to think that this is going to make everything much worse right that this is something transformational um, so i mean why do you think you know why do you think i mean do you think that they, that people didn't think this argument was going to catch any flack, or I mean, why why was this why was this particular article um, uh, received with such enthusiasm? Well, I'm a uh, you know I may, I may be a slightly prejudiced on this myself. The last post I wrote before this one on uh, the Marine Corps Gazette blog, which is again our kind of professional blog, mm -hmm. uh, was in fact a open letter to the editor of the Marine Corps Gazette, uh, retired Colonel uh, Keenan, mm -hmm. uh, in rebuttal to an open letter that he wrote to the entire community, mm -hmm. where he basically used his bully pulpit as the editor of our professional journal um, to come out very strongly again, just basically telling, uh, it was an open letter to the Secretary of Defense, in fact, where he basically uh, beseeched um, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, to go against whatever, you know, at all costs, keep women mm -hmm. out regardless of what the studies showed, you know, ignore the fact that, yes, they have served well in combat zones, you know, as members of female engagement teams. Um, but, but please, uh, Mr. Secretary, do not let these women in our infantry. Um, so I've, I had already written uh, one rebuttal to this, this general topic uh, that was directed um, an open letter to the editor. Uh, so to me, this appears to just be a pattern. Again, she won this award in 2013. Mm -hmm. 12 months later, uh, it is now 2014, and the article is just being published at a time when we're going through. I mean, uh, 2015 is the deadline for the services to come back to Secretary of Defense and say we have either um, we concur there's no reason to continue discrimination or here's our argument for continuing discrimination. So I think that this article was selected, again, um, based simply on the fact that uh, they found a female Marine who, who wrote an article that was um, holding up the status quo. Uh, they selected her for an award and gave her three thousand uh, dollars. That, to my mind, she doesn't merit because her, her essay, you know, on its surface, um, besides being poorly researched and cited, uh, even though she is a, a graduate student, um, again, I think it was it was selected and it was its release was timed to support a institutional message of let's keep women out of the infantry. Now. I have heard the I have heard I have heard the case, and this is I want to touch on this, and then I want to work on move on to some of your other work, especially on the warrior ethos, because I think it's connected. Um, I have heard the case that um, there was as much or more resistance um, towards uh, the end of don't ask, don't tell, the integration of gays into uh, the military in the Marine Corps as there was in any of the any of the services, um, but that post decision, um, the Marine Corps has actually been among the um, 
so are more committed to outreach into the gay community. Is this is this something that you you have seen or not seen uh, as a in, in your in your? I mean, this is actually from from within the gay community. Um, my friends within the gay community have actually told me that you know the Marines have been sort of more committed about having a presence at gay events and having recruiters in, um, in, uh, you know, mostly gay areas and so forth. Um, I mean, is this something that has been true in your experience or that you know of, or. I don't know that I've ever heard of a, and I'll be quite honest. I'm not in the recruiting game myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, and I've known, um, several gay Marines. I'm pretty sure everybody has. I in fact have one who works for me. She's awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the Marine Corps has a, a again, historical tendency and it's been demonstrated at least twice through history. We are the, the last service to steadfastly resist a sociological change. Mm -hmm. And then when the order finally comes down from on top to make the change. Um, we are the first and the best to do it. And it's, it has something to do with the fact that we are, in fact, the smallest service um, mm -hmm. and we are a very tight knit service. So it's once the order comes down, um, it's much easier for us to make it happen. Um, because we are so small and so close knit. Uh, so it does not surprise me, in fact, that if we have better, been better at our outreach, um, it is because we historically have actually been, um, we have always made our recruiting goals um, at even at times when the other services were struggling to make theirs. We're very good at public relations. Um, it does not surprise me at all. And the reality is, is once you, once you get rid of the stereotype and once you say you're not going to accept, you know, gay bashing or discrimination or, or racism, whatever it is that we're, we're, we decided we're going to get away from. Um, most Marines, especially younger Marines today, because I genu genuinely believe that the old fogies like me, you know, at 41 years of age, um, represent kind of the last bastion. Because I actually came up in a military that was very homophobic, um, mm -hmm. fairly racist, um, still very sexist. Uh, and I grew out of that. You know, that was what I was inculcated in my you know, early development. Um, and I grew out of that partly because I have um, some great female uh, examples in my life from my mm -hmm. sisters, many of my uh, my female friends and associates. Um, but yes, it does not surprise me at all that we have done better um, with our outreach to the gay community and with just our acceptance. Um, there's still challenges. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, you have a Marine who can get married in one state, but when her marriage does not work out, um, if the state she is in does not recognize gay marriage, it does not give her the option to get divorced. So you have some interesting problems. Um, but I think that, again, once uh, if, if we can break this final ceiling, and genuinely, this is one of the last bastions of where we say that women can't. Because we previously said, you know, women can't be in the cockpit, they can't be in the spacecraft, they can't be on the aircraft carrier, they can't be in the submarine. And it turns out that once you let them into all these things, they actually do really well at it. Um, and so if we can break this one of these last strongholds, I think that really young women will be able to look at the world and say, I can do anything. Yeah. So I mean, let's move on to sort of the related, um, or at least in my mind, related uh, argument. So you, you've also written a, a book about um, the warrior ethos, right? The, 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 um, uh, the Marine Corps' warrior ethos, um, and you've sort of identified some issues with it. And, and I, I'll confess that I haven't had a chance to read it. But um, what's your, like, what's your, your sort of, foundational argument in the in the book you put together well i guess uh, before i can describe my foundational argument uh, mm -hmm. this book like um many of my blog posts actually starts out by uh by doing a critique of somebody else's work mm -hmm. in this case it is a, a fairly famous author um stephen pressfield uh he wrote um gates of fire which is the the book on which the movie 300 was based uh he wrote uh, the last amazon his his genre sort of is to write historical fiction mm -hmm. um, set uh, during the um, uh, the period of Sparta, the period of Athens. Uh, and he does write fairly good historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, he recently, and I believe it was 2012 perhaps, uh, turned his hand to writing a sort of a, a handbook for young Marines. Um, he's a, a former Marine himself. I mm -hmm. believe he's in the reserves in the 1960s. <laughs> in a very different time. Uh, and his book, his book was titled The Warrior Ethos, and it was selected by the Commandant to be a book that you know, every Marine um, was required to read. Uh, it replaced a very excellent book by uh, uh, a great Marine general, uh, General Victor Kulak, mm -hmm. um, called First to Fight. 
Um, and so I, uh, as every Marine is required to do professional reading. I was in Afghanistan, had a little bit of free time. It was a very small book. So I said, I'll, I'll just knock it, knock this one out. Um, and I started reading it and I was so dismayed by the, by the message that was in that book, um, which was extremely misogynistic, mm -hmm. uh, extremely backwards looking. It basically, uh, was trying to suggest that if we would just ourselves like Spartans or like, um, Alexander the Great and his men, um, if we would just act like that instead of these kind of weak, soft Americans, um, this warrior society or this warrior mm -hmm. um, embedded in a non-warrior culture, um, because that was what he was really glorifying was this idea that if America would be more of a warrior culture like right. Sparta, um, perhaps she could produce, you know, the true warriors. But the sort of warrior culture that, that Sparta was, was a culture that um, uh, basically, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the, um, the term hazing. Right, right. Thing is basically when you you physically or verbally abuse people with the idea that it'll somehow make them harder or tougher or a better part of the human, and that was really that was the Spartan training way. They would take a young man. Um, obviously, women were completely excluded, um, but they would basically beat him and harass him. Um, and then when he was a little older, he could beat and harass other people. Uh, and yes, if you were going to go um, face to face and sword to sword and shield to shield and bash it out with Persians, um, that may have been a, a, a necessary evil. Um, but it turns out that the, the Spartans did not historically have a very good run of things. Um, right. One might wonder where is Sparta today? It was never a great empire. Uh, it had a few um, victories. And, and even the, the case of uh, the 300 Spartans, which is what everybody thinks about, and they have a little stone dedicated to them. Uh, there were 300 Spartans. There were also about 4,000 other Greeks who were there at Thermopylae. Um, they didn't go there intending to commit suicide. They didn't realize how big the Persian force they were facing. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of uh, historical inaccuracies, and Pressfield is too smart and too well researched of a historical fiction writer not to know the truth about Sparta. Um, for example, they had uh, ritual murder of their slaves. They were basically a slave-based culture, and that was why um, Spartan men, which were again a very small percentage of the actual population, be a, a Spartan citizen and a male. Um, basically meant that you'd been born with no birth defects because if there was anything wrong with you, you were right. out on a rock for the wolves. Uh, so it was this basically this idea that this is not, it didn't even work very well for Sparta in the long run, and it's certainly a recipe for disaster in America. All right, it's a it's a it's a deeply selective understanding, and the name uh, what my brain was screaming at me the entire time you're talking was Victor Davis Hanson, right? Who has sort of the same vision. Uh, yeah. um, of um, uh, sort of this warrior ethos, only he, he tries to impute it to it all of Western culture, which has been shredded by by lots of historians of, of warfare. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a deeply selective understanding that um, that really privileges the tactical to a degree that is is you know uh, sort of almost impossible to believe when you're really thinking about it, right? Um, you know, the reasons why there there were. There have been important tactical reasons why some empires or some forces through history have won, right, um, or, or have prevailed, have become important, um, and a lot of these sort of ply in or play into this certain kinds of warrior ethos. But at the same time, uh, you know, what makes Rome great is you know, surely the legions and their tactical effectiveness, but also Roman strategic decision making, right, which is not at all about what's being talked about here, right? I mean, it's about the ability to, to rationally prioritize and create a sensible ordering of forces and um, create a logistic system which is capable of supplying um, massed forces wherever they happen to be. Um, and so, um, you know, it's, it's such a belief that it seems to me that almost everything about this sort of warrior ethos concept is such a blinker understanding of what warfare actually is, right? Warfare from the political to the strategic to the operational to the tactical, right? All of these are critical. The tactical is important, but it's not everything, right? And, and nobody should think about it as everything, right? And this... Yeah. Well, in Pressfield's defense, and mm -hmm. strange that I'll come to his defense, but I believe that he genuinely wrote his book mm -hmm. aimed at a very useful audience, um, which is actually the very dangerous thing about the book. Mm -hmm. So it is a little more focused on personal development as a, as a tactical individual, um, but a couple of the problems that it runs into very early is that, um, so honor is a big deal to Pressfield, um, because he 
gets wrapped around the idea that tribes have it right. Mm -hmm. And if you think about most tribal societies, uh, honor means um, courage and an eye for an eye, revenge-based um, warfare for men, and it means protecting your chastity for women, mm -hmm. uh, which is not really. Uh, and, and so there's the first problem. There's the first bit of misogyny. So if uh, if honor means two things, chastity for women and vengeance for men, well, then what about a woman in a warrior society? When 16% right. of our force is women, um, are they supposed to be chased? Or are they supposed to be out taking eyes for eyes? Um, what is their role? The other thing about tribes is it's that... A, it's a patriarchal assignment of roles, right? It's sort of a greater patriarchal system. But the difference between soldiers and warriors, there's because that's kind of uh, the idea is that a warrior is fundamentally better than a soldier. A soldier is there to pay, a soldier is there, you know, for whatever. But a warrior is there because he or she likes making war. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the problems with that uh, is that for a warrior, for, for warfare to be honorable for a warrior, um, I've got to be up against other warriors. So just killing a bunch of women and children or some unarmed men, that's no fun. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm going to be a warrior, I should face my opponent in a fair fight. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can prevail, then I'm a great man and I can, you know, write my name and blood on my chest. Um, and if I should fall to him, well, at least I died well as a warrior. So that's kind of the, the kind of the aggression, the classic Greek, that's um, Patrocles and that's Achilles. And that's their sort of battle. Right, um, and these are these are norms that we find, and these are warrior norms that we find in Native American cultures, in African, in medieval medieval Europe, in the, right. They're, they're all the, uh, the Taliban. They right. they too feel that a real man should come out and fight them, you know, armed AK-47 to M16. Mm -hmm. Right. But what does that say about the majority of our military that in fact um, does its killing from a great distance mm -hmm. and never faces its enemy in anything close to open combat? In fact, it's uh it's kind of odd to us. Why would I why would I get in a gunfight with a guy if I can um, hit him and maybe some other people in the car as well with a drone strike. Why would I put myself in that position? So there's the other big problem is that um, we are not, we've certainly gone beyond a tribal culture. Um, although it's, it's very telling that right now you're actually hearing at a national level, you know, calls for vengeance. So, you know, a, a, an organization, you know, beheads one person and you have a national call for vengeance and vengeance is not necessarily the basis of a, a good foreign policy or a, Again, your strategic level foreign policy is vengeance for, but, but we really are almost getting back. There, there's definitely a very strong tribal leaning um, that's very quick to activate under certain mm -hmm. circumstances. Yeah. But that's, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, rather than, than acknowledging the fact that all of us have these tribal impulses and how do we control and channel them better, um, Pressfield says we should exult in them, um, and that should be the basis for everything and kind of goes forward from there. Right, right, and and, and I mean, I think this brings us to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which was you know in reference to um, the military campaign, you know, Iraq War Three, what what some people are calling it, um, but the the new campaign against ISIS, right? I mean, ISIS itself does sort of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here because ISIS itself does kind of exult in this warrior ethos, while at the same time. You know, manifesting very sophisticated operational decision-making capabilities, right? You know, very sophisticated strategic logics um, that sort of belie this notion of just sending guys out to, you know, you know, the uh, Marcus of Keens Queensberry fighting in the middle of a field, right? Um, but our response to this, which is certainly driven by these tribal dynamics, our response to this is, you know, what it would seem like from a warrior ethos is the most unfair combat of all, right? Which is, you know, technology-driven, asymmetric warfare airstrikes against Taliban, or not Taliban, but ISIS positions, right? Um, and, you know, and, and, and at the, you know, at the same time, we sort of, uh, we, there might be a potential to criticize this, this is as it should be, right? We should not be seeking a fair fight with ISIS. ISIS does not seek a fair fight with the people that it's fighting with, right? It seeks to work on, ASA, you know, to create advantages and then exploit those advantages, right? And we should be, if, to the extent we decide to fight ISIS, we should be determining what our advantage are, advantages are and then exploiting those advantages, which seem to run against sort of, you know, what you're thinking about here, what you're arguing about here in terms of this concept of warrior ethos. Well, I think you, you've actually hit on a good point, and I should uh, should make a note if I can. So 
there is so honor is one of those flexible things. Honor is what you decide to call honor. And it's interesting that um, the Marine Corps actually has its own because because honor, courage, commitment, those are our values. Um, and we actually have a definition of honor. And it just says it's the bedrock of our character, the quality that guides Marines to exemplify the ultimate in ethical and moral behavior. Uh, never to cheat, lie, steal, abide by a code of integrity, respect human dignity, um, have respect and concern for each other. It's a quality of maturity, education, trust, and dependability. It commits Marines to act responsibly, be accountable for their actions, fulfill obligations, and hold others accountable for their actions. Um, so that's our official definition. And you see that nowhere there does, it, does our definition require us to face our enemy in one-on-one -on -one combat right. or anything like that. So I say that uh, all we need to do as a Marine Corps, all we need to do is, as a national military service is put aside and debunk um, folks like Pressfield who would say that to be honorable, we have to behave like tribes historically have and say, no, our version of honor is this. Um, and that we're going to use some things like experience, um, Exam setting the example, showing empathy, um, educating our Marines and empowering them. So that's the basis for building strong modern warriors, not to try to act like Spartans or Macedonians. Um, but to bring that back to ISIS, so, so, so that's how I would argue to build, build a, good, a good Marine or a good soldier. And that's kind of what I talk about in the second half of my book where I say, OK, if Pressfield was wrong, mm -hmm. uh, as I've shown in my critique, then, then what should we do instead? Uh, but so that brings us back to, to ISIS and how do we match up against them? And that's um, something that you're, uh, you're interested in, in my, my opinion on. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'll, let's go over it. I will, I will caveat this by saying that uh, it is not my, my complete subject matter expertise, mm -hmm. uh, but that early on in their, um, their push into Iraq, I wrote a couple of um, posts over Duck of Minerva mm -hmm. uh, on the fact that their, their operational um, – their operational technique, uh, what we call an operational concept in the Navy and Marine Corps. Um, and operations kind of is that bridge between the tactical level and the strategic level. Um, but the operational concept they were using was one that had been proven very effective in, uh, in Africa already um, in two separate campaigns by Islamic fundamentalist groups. Um, the first in Mali, um, where uh, it was actually stopped uh, sort of the last minute by a very uh, – focused and a very large French reaction force mm -hmm. that included a great deal of air power, but also included uh, a large number of ground forces um, and where it was allowed to go unchecked without a large boots on ground and heavy air power for an intervention in the Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. They, in fact, succeeded in overrunning the capital, um, throwing the existing state out of power, taking control. And then that later uh, sort of inevitably broke down a civil war. But the, the operational concept is essentially to use um, uh, very lightly armed forces uh, mounted in these uh, technicals, which is essentially a pickup truck with a heavy machine gun mounted on the back. Uh, and you don't try and fight anybody one on one or force on force. You sweep around obstacles, um, you make use of the fact that you, you move at very high speeds. Uh, you don't require any extensive logistics train, unlike uh, the Marine Corps, um, because all you have is a pickup truck. So you just stop at a gas station, you bring a five gallon jerry can full of gas. You can move very quickly. You can pick up food and uh, ammunition from your for your machine guns, capture your vehicles, everything you need. Um, it's almost a Napoleonic version of just uh, picking up what you need from the countryside. Right. Um, so this had been uh, had been exemplified twice in recent history, and it was in fact the very same methodology that the Taliban used in their early conquest of most of Afghanistan when they were fighting um, what later became the Northern Alliance. Uh, and again, it is a tech technique that works exceptionally well against Western trained and equipped militaries. Because if you're a Western trained and equipped military, um, your kind of method is uh, you wear a distinctive uniform, you have a reasonably decent weapon, um, but your big thing is that you're waiting for direction from someone. Right. Somebody's going to tell you when to go and do something. Um, they're going to tell you whether to attack or retreat or to hold your ground. Um, and if somebody doesn't tell you, then you kind of look to your left and right and wonder, is anybody else going to tell us? And you're looking for your bosses and they may not be around. Whereas the, the ISIS um, or the Torig tribesmen, they're not waiting for direction from anybody because they already know what they need to do. They need to kill some infidels. Um, they need to take the next town. If the next town proves hard, they just go around it and, and look for a weaker target. Um, they have kind of the, what we call the commander's intent. 
-hmm. So they know what the commander's intent is, and they're going to execute it as best they can. And if they run up to a roadblock, they're just going to apply some common sense and try and work their way around it. And if they die in the line of duty, well, that's okay. They're going to heaven. Not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas these Western trained militaries, that's not what they signed up for. Mm -hmm. They may not know what the commander's intent is. Um, they're waiting for somebody to tell them kind of how to take the next move because that's how we train them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not equipped to move quickly or to forge off like the enemy. Right, and 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 these these Western tendencies, I I, I guess I would add, and I wonder what you think about this. Um, so these these tendencies that you talk about in the Western military are exacerbated in the kinds of forces that, um, in particular, that um, ISIS and its and its analogs have been fighting. Right, I mean, the Iraqi army has has you know is a Western trained force along Western models, but it has not sort of been around long enough to develop the bonds of trust and the bonds of expertise in its soldiers, right? You know. And I suspect you'll find they don't even have the level of command and control right. uh, that we associate that, that allows us, again, we func we have some of the same functional problems, but we've developed our command and control networks very well. And I'll, I'll use a mm -hmm. case in point. Um, I actually spent a year in Saudi Arabia training uh, their Marine Corps mm -hmm. in counter-terror operations. Um, uh, what was a supply officer doing in, Marine, in Saudi Arabia training Marines in counterterrorism? I was teaching heavy machine guns and mortars and tow missiles. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I was actually there was because when we sold them a bunch of um, equipment years before, we'd also sold them this, uh, this advanced computer database that was supposed to manage all their logistics. Mm -hmm. um, it's guys like me, um, these supply officers who knew how to run this database. So I was being sent there as an advisor to help them keep the database up and running. Uh, but when I got there, what I found was um, they didn't have any network computers. Um, there was no supply requisition was never filled without, you know, three signatures from the commanding general. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to see the commanding general was uh, not if you were one of his officers, but if you were one of his tribesmen, if you were somebody right. in the same right. tribe. Um, so a lot of the things that we just kind of assume in the U.S. military are going to make this machine, the, the oil and the gears make the machine run, uh, don't necessarily exist in many of these countries that uh, don't have the same, they don't have a uh, non-commissioned officer corps, uh, they don't have network computers, um, they may have much, uh, tribal allegiances may mean much more than rank. Um, so that is one of the, the challenges that, that I think they face as well. Right. Well, let's move, I want to move on from this because there was one other topic that uh, we definitely had to talk about um, because, I mean, you mentioned it in sort of our initial email con uh, uh, discussions. Um, but, and, you know, this has also sort of a lot of, it's in the desert, there's a lot of logistical problems. So let's talk about Burning Man, right? What What's interesting to you about Burning Man? Did you go to the most recent Burning Man or do you, do you or? I actually did go to the most burning uh -huh. recent, or the most recent Burning Man. Sorry, uh -huh. it's been, I'm a bit tired. Uh -huh. um, Yes, and in fact, I was struck uh, by many parallels between um, uh, Burning Man, which most people, if they know what it is at all, probably kind of just sort of disregard as a bunch of hippies, you know, mm -hmm. driving shiny cars around the desert. Right. Uh, right. But in fact, I saw a great many parallels and actually things that we can learn um, from the last time I was at a big camp in the desert, which was a little place called a Camp Bastion, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is uh, Camp Bastion, uh, which I think at its height housed about uh, 50,000 personnel, took four months to build. Um, uh, Burning Man took a couple of weeks. Um, it is erected in the middle of the Black Rock Desert, a very inhospitable place. Uh, the other difference is um, when we leave Afghanistan, uh, Camp Bastion, you know, minus maybe some of its um, uh, more unique structures, will pretty much stay in the hands. Uh, there'll be a great deal of waste, a great deal of environmental degradation there. Uh, if you go back to the Black Rock Desert today, um, you won't find any trace of Burning Man. Um, the entire thing, a, a city of 78,000 people, has been um, erected and obliterated in the period of about a month or so. Um, so just the logistics to make that happen was very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some other interesting kind of uh, uh, correlations. So we talked about the size and construction time, um, but I was very found it very familiar. There was a chow hall there. Uh, I was actually one of the few people at Burning Man who had a real job. Uh, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, when I signed up for my free ticket, uh, what I was getting on board with was um, I was the assistant manager of the world's largest coffee shop. So <laughs> one, one coffee shop in a city of 78,000, 
um, you can imagine they did pretty um, stiff business. But mm-hmm. one of the, the advantage I got with that was um, I got to go to the mess hall. Mm-hmm. So again, in the, the middle of the desert, very much like Camp Bastion, they stood up uh, an expeditionary mess hall and it feeds you know thousands of people um, very efficiently, um, cleans all the stuff, it does it in a very environmentally friendly manner. Um, what else? Uh, security and crowd control. Um, ex- again, they, they are faced with a very similar challenge. It is a fenced off, it is a gated mm-hmm. um Aided community, much like Camp Bastion was. Uh, they have a definite interest in keeping outsiders out, um, just like we did. They actually did, I believe, a better job in some cases than we did in Afghanistan. Uh, and the, the final uh, note about that was that the difference, uh, well, the similarity and the difference is both of them were, were theoretically, anyway, all volunteer forces. Mm-hmm. So nobody was at Burning Man who did not want to be at Burning Man. Nobody was forced to go there. Nobody was obliged to. Um, Everybody was there doing what they wanted, but unlike in the military, where your first act is to raise your hand and volunteer, and after that, it's kind of a kind of a crapshoot somewhere. Right, right. Kind of challenge. Um, really, at Burning Man, you were literally doing what you wanted to do. So, if you wanted to help um, build the infrastructure, if you wanted to actually erect buildings and run power lines, um, you did that. And if you wanted to be crowd control, you did that. Um, and if you wanted to run the airport, it actually has its own airport. If you wanted to be an air traffic controller. You did that. Um, if you wanted to work in a coffee shop, you did that. Mm-hmm. And it was very, very much volunteer driven. There were very few paid positions, I believe, um, organizational staff. But uh, I would say 98, 99 percent of the people who made this thing happen completely volunteers. Um, so that was really interesting. Uh, went to um, a TEDx convention there. Um, Dennis Kucinich, I think, was the guest, was the, the, the keynote speaker. Mm-hmm. I think Grover Norquist was out, also out there. I mean, there was yes. a, a who's who. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I still have uh, Grover's beaten me to the blogging on Burning Man. <laughs> um, I'm coming on that. Um, met other military officers out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of the things I found really interesting, uh, Ori Brofman, the author of uh, The Starfish and the Spider, which actually is, if you have not read it, it's a great book. Um, and it, uh, it ties right back into what we are talking about in ISIS, where ISIS is that organization that, that like the starfish, um, will regenerate if you cut one of its legs off um, and is a uh, – it's a, a community. It's an idea. It's, it's a community that, that's not going to be as easily destroyed as some other um, organizations. Uh, but one of the things I really found very interesting was the potential, I thought, for – long-term communities of shared interest. And I say communities of shared interest because that's sort of what I consider Burning Man to be. Um, like I said, everybody was there because they wanted to be there. They wanted to participate. Uh, and it's it's a culture where participation is the goal. Mm-hmm. The goal is not to go there and be a spectator or be sort of a leech. The goal is to go there and participate in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but as I was riding out there from San Francisco, one of the big topics on the bus uh, was the um, the increasing lack of affordable housing in San Francisco. Right, right, right. right. Uh, but it was very interesting to me that um, these same people who were talking about, oh, what, what will we do about this lack of affordable housing, were in fact going to go create a bunch of affordable housing in the middle of nowhere um, and run it effectively for a little while and then tear it all down. And I said, well, why why couldn't we do the same thing, you know, just slightly outside one of our larger metropolises? You know, just find government land. This is Burning Man. It's done on, on BLM land. Um, just ensure that you have some public transportation that runs the city so people who need to work at a physical job can do that. Um, other people might just telecommute from their uh, very interesting structures, everything from tents to mobile homes to yurts constructed out of um, sort of space age material. Uh, why, could, why couldn't you have a community like that that lasted longer than one it was, in fact, and again, it was a community, a, a community of shared interests. You might have one that was, you know, all this or all that, or you might have one that was very integrated with a lot of uh, groups. So, those are some of my uh, takeaways from Burning Man. Um, and right. I will. Oh, go well, ahead. Yeah, to circle to circle back to what was just our, our our discussion, right? I mean, is there is there also potentially a parallel to ISIS, right? I mean, could ISIS be one of these communities of shared interest, right. um, and- who you know undoubtedly have things that are kind of like Burning Man out into the desert that, but, you and know. I think that's, that's what I wanted to, to touch on was that in fact, ISIS is a community of shared interests. Um, and it is also, uh, we need to be very honest about what it is. It is not just, uh, 20,000 jihadis running around the desert killing people. It's also organization and administration, the, the, the territories they control 
And very much like the Taliban did, one of the things they do bring is they bring stability um, to areas that may not have been very stable. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are rational actors. So this is another one of those things. Uh, I think um, critical thinking is one of the things that, uh, that I like to read about, and focus on, and think about. Um, so when uh, ISIS militants you know, beheaded somebody, when they've done any of the atrocious things they've done, uh, they did not do it just because they're jerks. Uh, they are rational actors. Um, they too can think several steps ahead and think about, okay, if we, if we execute this person, um, what is his, um, what is his native country probably going to do? How is that going to affect our end game? Um, and if you look at some of the moves that, um, that many larger countries are making now, uh, you have to see that they are actually being sucked into a, a situation where they're, they don't necessarily have a good end game. Um, we are now talking about essentially funneling arms to the Free Syrian Army. Uh, and we already know that um, ISIS can beat the Free Syrian Army pretty much any time it wants. So if I give the Free Syrian Army a bunch of arms, um, what's going to happen is ISIS is going to sweep in the next week and probably knock them down, take most of those weapons. Uh, yeah, so I think ISIS is definitely a community of shared interests. Again, nobody's, nobody's fighting for ISIS because someone forced them to fight for ISIS. People are coming from all over the world to join the ISIS burning man, except with ISIS, you're actually burning a man. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but yeah, so community of shared interests, uh, and, and they do have, there is a desire in some parts of the world for what they are selling. Um, there, there are people to whom the idea of an Islamic caliphate uh, is very, uh, first off, it does have a historical precedence, and it does have a resonance. And if you look at the original caliphate, the original caliphate was very similar. They were a very light force that swept across the desert and unified a lot of people under a fairly bloody rule. But the interesting thing is that over time, they became very moderate and they became actually a, uh, a source of a lot of our scientific knowledge or a lot of our philosophical knowledge. Um, and then that did fade away over time as well. So, uh, but I assure you, if this, if we were looking at the, the original prophet and the original caliphs, when they were unifying Saudi Arabia, most of the Middle East and most of Turkey, under Islam in the first couple of hundred years of Islam, uh, we would probably think it was pretty shocking too. Uh, but that's our sensibilities running up against some very different sensibilities. Well, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think it's all the time, but uh, hopefully we can have you on again at some point and uh, talk about some of these things or some of the other things. Rob, it would be my pleasure. I really do appreciate the opportunity and I will look forward to uh, watching the show. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Blogging Heads viewers. Um, we uh, uh, thank you, uh, as always, for watching. And uh, Ed, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we will talk again soon. Thank you. Take care.